if you're a business owner, there's going to come a point where you need a stronger tech stack to have a clear picture of everything all in one place. From startup to enterprise, NetSuite is your one-stop solution. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast too. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers. 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have been upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. 25, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you can get a customized solution for all of your KPIs and one efficient system when, with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There was once a time when building a website was a massive undertaking and a huge pain, something that you would need to clear your entire schedule for. Well, guess what? Those days are over, and now you can build a professional, sparkling website in just seconds, thanks to Hostinger. In fact, I recently did this, and I shared the process on my YouTube channel, and it was absolutely mind-blowing, especially considering it took like days on end previously when I first started building websites. This tool is amazing, and I was using AI to do it. So Hostinger is a top highly rated global web hosting and website creation brand, right? And all you have to do to build a website is answer three questions. Here it is. You enter your brand name, you select the website type, you describe your business, and then you can customize it further with a drag and drop editor. It's literally that simple. I just went through this process. I promise you, it is the easiest way to build a website. And it also offers some AI-driven SEO-friendly copy, an AI logo maker. Plus, they make all this super affordable. It's less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name. H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. It's incredible. Now back to the show. People don't understand the importance of treating your customers well and how if you treat your customers well, you take care of them, you involve them with your brand, they become obsessed with you. And when you have customers that are obsessed with you, they promote you, they tell their friends, they post about you on social media, they write you reviews, and then you get business just because of them. So you don't have to do other things. Like you don't have to show up on social media every day. You don't have to do advertising if you don't want to. And I really feel like that the future of e-commerce. Have you ever thought about creating a physical product business? Or perhaps you have an audience already and you've thought about creating a physical product to share and sell to your audience. Well, if that is a thought that's come across your mind, then this is definitely an episode for you. We're talking with Carrie Fitzgerald from carriefitzgerald.com. She's also the host of the Six Figure Product Business Podcast, and she helps business owners create physical products for their business. Everything from teaching them how to create merch and things like t-shirts and mugs, which is sort of on the simpler side, all the way through things like white labeling and manufacturing and whatnot. So we're gonna talk about a lot of things today, including an incredible launch strategy for your product that I definitely agree is the number one strategy. And she, she brings the heat with this today. She also has a book called Customer Obsession because what I love about Carrie, she's not just about the products and the making money and she's been able to do really, really well with her own physical product businesses before teaching others, but it's about helping people and brand loyalty and getting obsessed with your customers. And that's in fact the name of her book, Customer Obsession, which I love and it fits perfectly with my book, Super Fan. So really good vibe here. And I really love the information that Carrie had to share. And so if you've thought about a physical product, this is the episode for you, session 741 of the ASPI podcast with Carrie Fitzgerald. Here she is. You're listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, a proud member of the Entrepreneur Podcast Network, a show that's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, Nerds Gummy Clusters are his kryptonite, Pat Flynn. Job searches can feel like they're taking forever, a real slog. So stop searching and just match with Indeed. So ditch the busy work, use Indeed for scheduling, screening, messaging, so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. If you want to hire fast, you need 
to go where the talent is. Get unparalleled access to job seekers with over 350 million unique visitors globally, according to Indeed data, and an extended reach through Glassdoor. I love how adaptable Indeed is uh, as well, whether you're hiring one person or you need lots for a scalable project, like hiring platform that lets you schedule and interview hundreds of candidates in one day, like there's no other one that you would wanna use. So join more than three and a half million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive. Terms and conditions apply. You need to hire, you need Indeed. If you're at a desk a lot like I am, it is really important to move around and increase circulation as much as possible. And a sit slash stand desk can be a massive game changer. If you haven't tried one before, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Uplift Desk is the place to go. There are so many customization options, plus free 30 day returns, free shipping, free accessories with every desk. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? It's no wonder they've been wire cutters pick for six years in a row. Plus, they offer a great range of ergonomic chairs and storage systems if you want to give your whole workspace a makeover. They even have an augmented reality feature so you can see what your new desk will look like in your space using your phone. I mean, they even make a height-adjustable conference table that doubles as a regulation-sized ping-pong table. These folks have really thought of it all. And if you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Just go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. Carrie, welcome to the SPI podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here. Now, the first time that you and I sort of crossed paths was through a mutual friend of ours, Rick Mulready, and I went in to speak at a mastermind group and you were there and I didn't know much about what the individuals in the space were doing and I had no idea that what you're doing is so cool. I mean, and I say that because I've touched a little bit of what you're doing and, and I have so many questions. Why don't you tell the world a little bit about who you are and, and what you your superpower is today? Awesome. Thank you so much. So my name is Carrie Fitzgerald and I am definitely a multi-passion entrepreneur. I definitely do a lot of different things um, like you, but I help people start, create or grow or scale their e-commerce or product-based businesses. So I work with a lot of people who have an idea for a physical product, but they get stuck at that. Okay, I have an idea for something, but like, how do I bring it to life? There's so many questions. There's so many things that people get hung up on. And so I help people kind of take an idea and then figure out, is this the right idea? Is this going to be profitable? How do I do this? And then I also help people once they have an online store to grow it through mostly organic marketing. I don't do anything with ads. So I'm all about organic like email marketing, affiliates, customer loyalty programs, all that kind of stuff. So I kind of do both things, but I'm really, really, really passionate about helping people start a product-based business because I know when I started my first business seven plus years ago, I had no idea where to go, had no idea like how to get started. And I think so many people out there listening in terms of your audience probably have an idea of a product that they might want to do but they just have no idea how to get started. And I think that can like paralyze people. And so I love helping people just kind of dive in. And I know today it's easier now more than before to start one of these kinds of businesses. However, we still need the guidance and, and that's why you are here. However, I wanna start with you making the case for a physical product specifically. Why should we even think about doing that when a digital product is so much easier to manage to, you know, there's no inventory. There's, you know, if you, if something is wrong, you can fix it immediately and it's changed and it's scalable. Why a physical product though? I think a few reasons. I think one, the future of purchasing. I mean, more people are buying stuff online, more people are gravitating away from the brick and mortar, you know, like think of Black Friday, maybe 20 years ago, you would have to, you know, wake up at 5 a.m., wait in line outside like a Best Buy to get a TV. Now it's like, click, 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 Amazon, done. It's already on your way to your house. You're sitting in your house, whatever you're doing. So I think more and more people are buying online. E-commerce is growing, it's booming. And when I hear that, I just see opportunity for people. And I think we can look at Amazon versus small business. And Amazon is obviously Amazon. They are the giant in the room, but there's a place for small business. There's a place for being the smaller person. And I think 
you know, another part of why physical product is something that you would appreciate because obviously you have your book, Customer Superfans. And I think with physical product, there is such a level of like personalization. People get invested in brands. You get, let's say like a jewelry or a makeup product and you get it in your mailbox and you can like gush over the packaging and the customer experience. And then the, the brand is sending you emails. They're inviting you in to be part of the brand. And I think there's a special thing that happens. It's like a special relationship that can really grow from a physical product that can't really happen from a digital product. So I love digital stuff. I sell that too. I think it's great. I think it's great to do all the things, but I think there's something to be said for a physical product and grabbing a customer in. And then once they buy from you once, you put the charm on and then they buy from you over and over and they are a customer super fan. So yeah few reasons why. No, that is a great answer. I mean, for somebody who has created one physical product, the Switch Pod, I can say there is some sort of magic in selling something and seeing a person open that thing and, and get like immediate use out of it. And, it, you know, it's all of a sudden made something more convenient or has helped our lives in some way instantly versus sometimes a digital product that's like, okay, I've sold a course, but you still have to go through the course and you still have to implement and it can take some time. There's a little bit of a delay before that reward. And there is something so beautiful about creating something that people purchase and just get immediate value from, which is great. Which leads me to my first question, which I'm sure a lot of people are asking, which is like, where do I even begin with all this? I mean, let's say somebody has an idea, actually even before that, like what are the best kinds of physical products that we could be thinking about? I mean, the the possibilities are endless, right? I could I could come up with an idea for something electronic that could do this thing, but then my mind goes, well, I don't have any experience with that. I don't know how to make that. I don't even know what's possible. Can you help wrap our heads around the directions or maybe some of the first steps here when it comes to building a physical product? I think the biggest thing, and I forgot to mention one other thing I want to touch on when you ask why physical is, I think for a lot of people in your audience too, it's like they already have audiences, they're course creators, they have memberships, they, they're doing all those things. They already have an audience of people like literally ready to buy. So I think part of the issue when you are starting a product brand, when you have no audience, which is what I did when I started my first business, you have to build that audience up and that can take time. So if you already have an audience, like it's jackpot. So I just want to touch on that because I forgot okay. to mention that. And that's such an important point. Does that mean if we don't have an audience, we're not quite ready yet? No, not at all. It just, it, you have to work differently. Okay, got it. You know, when you have an audience of people ready to buy, you, you sprinkle the seed, you let them know, you take them behind the scenes, but you have people that are like the day you launch, they're buying, they're pre-buying for you. With a someone who doesn't have an audience, you just have to work on building that audience from scratch, which that's what I did. That's mainly the people I work with. They have no audience and they have to like, build all that. It doesn't mean it's, it doesn't mean you can't do it. It's just, it's a little bit longer and you have to be more patient, but totally possible. Okay. Let's consider the person who does have an audience. Many of our audience does have an audience and where might they start with trying to determine whether a physical product makes sense or what that even might be? Yeah, I think it's just, you have to kind of think of one, what would you be excited to talk about? I think a lot of people will sit here and say, oh, don't do something that you're not, don't do something that you're passionate about. Make sure it's like the money maker. But I think in the end, if you're not going to be excited to talk about it extensively, then I wouldn't even bother wasting my time. So something that you could talk about, number two, think of a pain point that your audience has. This is the obvious one. What is something that your audience needs that you could introduce and it would solve a pain point for them or like work with your services or something. And then I think three, just is there something that you're already using? Like, for example, someone I worked with, she's a business coach, a course creator, and she was always wearing scrunchies in her hair. She would always wear scrunchies. She That was like her thing. So she thought, I'm going to create my own scrunchie brand. I'm already wearing oh, them. Cool. Let me just Let me just create my own scrunchie brand. And when she launched it, it was so seamless as an integration into her brand because she's already wearing them already talking about them. And then she could kind of create this thing around like my scrunchies make you feel more confident when you're on camera on your zoom call. So oh, I like it just like seamlessly fit in. And I think a lot of people that launch things like that, it makes so much sense because you're already you're already like wearing the product. So I think in that kind of sense, there's, is there something that you're saying like a phrase that you might say? So for me, I use the word obsessed all the time. I I say it all the time. I think I don't even mean to say it, but I always say it. So for me, I might come up with a t-shirt or a hoodie that says obsessed. Am I going to be the only one who buys it? Possibly. But 
that would kind of make sense. So is, is there like a tagline that you say? Is there something that could solve a need for your audience, like a, a journal? If you're like a mindset coach, you could create a journal with prompts. Instead of buying someone else's, you can create your own. So that would be a starting point. But in the end, I think if you have an idea for something that sort of fits in with your brand, awesome. If if not, that's also okay too. You know, you can really create anything, but I think it's easier if it fits in with your already business or audience. That makes sense. I love the scrunchy example because on the surface, it's like that has nothing to do with the thing that they're probably teaching. However, it's everything to do with the relationship that's being built with that person who's listening or watching the videos or a part of that brand. And it's a part of the culture, right? And a lot of people want to support because they're a fan of something, not just because it's a thing that, you know, would actually help them. And if it helps them, that's even better. We've seen examples of entrepreneurs in our space, like Michael Hyatt, go full on with journals, with his full focus journal. John Lee Dumas did the same thing with his mastery journal. So a journal is very popular. Now, I know in the world of like T-shirts and stuff, there are services out there that like you can just literally tell them what you want and then they'll make it, ship it and do all the drop shipping for you and everything like that. That's probably an easy low hanging fruit for people who already have a brand would be something like a phrase like obsessed on a shirt or something like that. We have our surf first shirts and stuff. So we, we do something similar. Would that be a good sort of starting point to create merch rather than like a, a utility, if you will? A hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. So that would be called like a print on demand type of product. Yeah. yeah, A hundred percent. And it's not even just the t-shirts. It is like you can do print on demand for so many things, any kind of apparel, houseware. I know mugs are a really popular one too. Yeah. Print on demand is great. Cause I think the biggest thing too is with print on demand, you can test different ideas and see if they work. So with traditional e-commerce, I shouldn't say traditional because you can do whatever you want, but you would buy, you know, you would order a hundred t-shirts, they would get shipped to your house. And then when someone orders, you ship them out yourself with print on demand, they're doing it for you. But I think the benefit of print on demand is like one, you don't have to buy upfront inventory, which is huge. I'm definitely an advocate of like, try not to get a ton of inventory before someone buys it because you end up possibly with inventory that is stuck in your house. And I've made that mistake many times, but with print on demand, you can test ideas. So you could come out with 10 different t-shirt idea uh, designs and just see, okay, which one do people buy? Then, you know, okay, if people buy these two, I'm going to focus on my marketing on those two. And I'm going to maybe create other things with those designs or slogans or something. So I think print on demand is awesome for testing and validating an idea, which is such an important part of e-commerce. Love it. When it comes to things that actually, first of all, do you have a print on demand service that you recommend or that you've worked with before that you like? Yeah. Printful. Printful. Yeah. Printful and Printify are like the top. I think they're like the top two, but they're both good. I've sold a kid's t-shirt on one and worked with clients on other ones, but I think they're both good for different reasons, but they're both good for anyone who's just starting out and they offer so many products. It's crazy. Awesome. What about a product that's not necessarily a mug or a t-shirt or something that's printable, but like you kind of have to get the thing made, right? I don't even know what it would be, but I, do you have any examples of students of yours who've like made something? Maybe the scrunchie is, is the example of, of something that actually had to get manufactured. What What's that process like? Because I think once people get to that realm of physical product, it's like, oh, there's not a service out there that can just kind of print on it, print it for me. That's way out of my league. I'm not qualified. Like this will never happen. But I know that's not true. Yeah. And I can give you another example that's like a step easier than the like full manufacturing prototype, all that kind of stuff. But I do have a good example for that. It would be something like different phrases people use, but like white labeling or reselling. There you go. So for example, I actually have an idea. I, this is something that I've, it's been on my like millions of ideas on my notepad for a long time, but I like, I love paddle boarding and I really, really, really want to start a paddle boarding brand or like a brand focused around paddleboarding or kayaking accessories. So like a hero product of a waterproof phone pouch, and then maybe like a couple different versions of like coolers that you can strap on the paddleboard. So like, that's my idea. So if I wanted to sort of take that to life, I would go to maybe like an Alibaba.com, which is a manufacturing website overseas. I would find someone who's already making the product. Then I would just white label it or create my own brand colors, logo, and that kind of thing. So you take a product that's already made and you just 
jazz it up with your own branding. So that would be really the next easiest thing to do other than like a print on demand, because you don't have to create the product from scratch. It already exists, but you can really personalize it with, for your vision, your vibe with the colors, logo, and design. And then sometimes, yes, you can also customize it with other things. But if we're just trying to keep it simple, you could think of like a waterproof foam pouch with different colors, different designs, things like that. And that's actually how most people will do physical product brand. They take a product that already exists and they just make it unique and different to their brand. And then it's really all about your marketing and your vibe. I mean, like paddle boards, there's a million paddle board companies. The one I like in particular their designs are super colorful. They're bright. They're vibrant. They have this like really vintagey feel to it versus a different paddleboard design that's like plain. The branding's plain. It's simple. So you're going to attract different people. So I think that's actually the next really easy way to do a physical product brand. That's really great. And that reminds me of actually the SwitchPod. When the SwitchPod was created, we actually, that was like a literal new invention. And that was hard. And we went to a bunch of people who had done physical products before. We're like, hey, do you have any advice? And they're like, why are you inventing something from scratch? <laughs> like that, you're going the hard route because there's so many parts that and we, we had to do it to get to the solution we wanted because that solution didn't exist. However, our second product was an accessory to go along with that. So you had mentioned like a hero product and then you have your like your accessories and that's a great way to continue to sell to the same customers. You just kind of have add-ons and things like that, which is kind of cool. Our second product was the ball head that goes on top of the SwitchPod. Caleb was actually in China to look at the SwitchPods coming off the line. Caleb was my partner on that project. And he saw a whole bunch of ball heads that were of different shapes and different sizes, different colors. And we were talking and they were like, we could make these and you could put SwitchPod on them and call them SwitchPod ball heads. And so that's exactly what we did. And we made a couple changes. We wanted a, a better rubber on one of them, but it moved the way we wanted it to. And we basically claimed it as our own, which is kind of cool. And that's exactly what you were talking about. And that has sold really, really well. And now it's sort of a bundle package that we sell together. So I really love that, that, that idea. And so you said Alibaba was the resource for that. And do you have any quick tips? I know there's you likely have a lot more information in depth on your own podcast as well as books and, and perhaps educational things that you have to offer as far as how to go about doing that because it's a process, I'm sure. But any tips for people going on to Alibaba for, you know, working with a company on the other side of the world and making sure, you know, everything's cool and safe and works well? You know, look, there's definitely a lot. I know in my experience with Alibaba for the some of the products that I've, um, I'll use the word manufacture because it's very loosely like, I manufacture dog bandanas, so it's not like I'm creating a this in, intricate phone carrier. But, you know, in the end, you still have to work with people. Um, I think the biggest thing is like looking at ratings and looking at like MOQ, making sure that they don't require huge quantities of inventory up front. So someone who has um, a low MOQ. It's minimum order quantity, is that? Yeah. So if you're looking to manufacture water bottles, I'm looking at a water bottle in my office, you know, find someone who can be flexible with the initial order amount and always get samples, always get a sample. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've made that mistake of not getting samples and you, and it's a mystery of what you might end up with. So be cautious of those things. And then just in general, like my best tip for a physical product brand is Choose something that is as small as possible, lightweight, and not breakable. I've made the mistake of ordering huge products and they come and I have to pay a billion dollars of custom fees and this and this versus if you get something that's lightweight, like I did dog bandanas and I have, they were custom made, they're awesome. But if it's lightweight and small, you know, you can order a huge quantity and they show up at your doorstep. There's no fuss. It's so much easier and you don't have to pay an arm and a leg for shipping. So a lot of people are like, I want to create this product. And it's like these huge breakable things. And I always say, oh my gosh, don't do that. Uh, yeah. I ordered something on Kickstarter. It was like an Ensington hourglass and it had these beads in it and it would count for like a half hour. And like half the people got them broke yep. <laughs> on, on shipping. And like, it was just an absolute mess. So I really love that piece of advice. With relation to that sample that you should get and or samples with the minimum order quantity, and I know it depends on the product, but like, what would you recommend for a person just starting out to expect to pay to at least get a sample to see what things are like? I mean, are we talking, 
you know, hundred to two hundred dollars? Are we talking thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars? Where where are we at, and what where would you kind of recommend we kind of start if we're kind of just dipping our tones in the water? No, the the samples would be, I would say, close to what the whatever the product price would cost. So if the product, I mean, it depends. It, uh, manufacturers will charge different things. I know, if, again, for like my dog bandanas, I think I paid like 20 bucks to get a bunch of samples of things. So not too much money. Oh, okay. It depends on the product itself. Sometimes that they will charge you more money for it, but it, it's sort of relative to whatever the product costs. So if your product is like $100, it might be 200 for a sample. It might be a little bit less. It, it kind of depends. I've worked with a few different manufacturers and I think they, they really do charge different amounts. Yeah, the, some will charge a little bit more because it's like they have to like make it like once and it's not going to go through a process where it's easier. So that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. So just be conscious of the money you're spending up front. The, I mean, these things add up, I'm sure. What are you, you had mentioned like customs fees perhaps. And I know that, you know, with SwitchPod, we dealt with like tariffs and, and whatnot. Are there any other like hidden things, costs related to this before we get into a little bit of the, the fun sort of pricing and marketing aspect of the conversation. Do you mean if you order from overseas? Or just just in the whole process in, in general, where where are people spending money where they maybe are surprised that they're spending money there? I mean, for me, the customs thing was a, was a huge shock. I had ordered boxes and this was, I was new in business. I had started the business maybe six months and I was like, I'm gonna order my boxes overseas because they're way cheaper and I'm gonna save so much money. And so I ordered these boxes and, you know, again, didn't get samples. I was living in Southern California at the time. So I had to drive to Long Beach. That's where the port is. And go pick them up. And yes, yeah, so the box that initially cost, I think, $1 ended up being $5 each because of the extra fees I had to pay. And I didn't know. Again, wow. this is part of the game. When you're an entrepreneur and you have a new business, you make mistakes. I've made a million of them and taken money and thrown it up into the air like confetti. And it's part of the process. But in the end, like, and now I know, okay, if I'm going to order a product that is large, you have to know that you're going to have to pay extra money if it gets shipped over on a boat. So now I know, but yeah, I ended up paying, I don't know, like a thousand dollars for these. And the boxes were so hideous. They were so bad. And my packaging for me with that business was really important. And I was so embarrassed and I was so upset because I just didn't want to use them, but I had to pay so much money for them that, you know. But I would say that's a that's a huge expense to, to be aware of. Otherwise, you know, if you're if you're getting stuff locally and you are pr doing the prototyping and it's like you're creating a product from scratch, that's where you're going to have to pay fees with prototyping samples, legal things, which we haven't even talked about. And you can start simple with legal stuff. But I think if you're doing something from scratch, it's like it's kind of a whole other like you did. That's a whole other you went like to the hardest possible way. Yeah, uh, we we did, didn't we? Gee whiz. We had to pay hundreds of thousands to get the molds made to then pour the casting metal into. I mean, it just like was a thing. Thankfully, it worked out in the end, but it was, it was, stuff, it, I was also seeing it as like education. <laughs> so I'm paying for my education on this too. And, you know, I feel like starting with somebody who's teaching the kinds of things that you are and at that level makes the most sense, especially if you have an audience. I mean, you can get these things out relatively quickly, right? Like what's the timeline on on most of these products as far as idea to like, you have the prototype and you're like, okay, like this is it, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with this. Like how soon until it's in your people's hands so we can, we can start talking like launch plan and all that kind of stuff? I think if you're doing like a white labeling or something like that, it's, I would say a few months, because if you're getting products shipped from overseas, you really have to factor in delays. Chinese New Year, right? Everything. Stuff gets delayed, stuff gets lost on the ship or lost in port or whatever. I've, you know, run into a million issues of things getting delayed. So just being mindful of that kind of stuff. But I would say a few months is normal. If it's a product that you got samples of that you ordered, Sometimes it can be faster, but I would say minimum like three months. I've worked with people where stuff just gets held up. That feels right to me, yeah. But I think a few months is manageable. So, And that's if you're doing something from overseas. If you're buying stuff in the U.S., then much faster. I was, for my, for my first business, most of the stuff I did at first was all in the U.S. And so I was able to come up with my idea. Again, I had no experience with the business. My background was not in e-commerce at all. And I just had to figure out what to do. 
I came up with my idea in March of 2016 and I launched in July. Pretty darn good. And that was like soft launch, small audience, scrappy as heck, you know, (laughs) figuring it out. (laughs) Yeah, I think the SwitchPod was two and a half years. So again, another case for maybe not inventing something from scratch. The Six Figure Product Business Podcast is your show. Definitely recommend everybody listen. We're not done yet. I'm just making sure people know where to go to, to find out more. And then also you have a book, I believe, that just came out, Customer Obsession, which I love hearing a title like that because this is, you know, I've, I've written super fans. It's very much customer centric and serve first. And I love that. What's the book about? Just really quick so people can know what to look forward to in it. Thank you so much. Yeah, it, it comes out next month. I'm, I'm so excited it's really about customer loyalty. So not I know your book is customer super fans, you know, all about the same thing. Mine is very much centric around e commerce product based businesses only. So it's definitely not for like a course creator. But it's really all the things that I learned with my first business, how to get your customers just to be obsessed with your brand. And I think to do that, you have to be obsessed with your customers, you have to understand why they're buying from you, you have to treat them well, customer service, I have a whole chapter about customer service, which I think for most people, they think, oh, that's boring. Customer service for a product based business is so essential. And just other things like how do you involve your customers with your brand? I think for me, that was a huge way that I grew my business, I didn't use advertising, I relied heavily on my customers to be like these brand evangelists for me. And I didn't know what I was doing. And I grew my business from, you know, zero to like 400,000 in sales in two and a half years. So for some people, they might think, oh, that's like pocket change. But for me, like I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't use advertising. I didn't pay influencers or anything. It was totally organic, totally scrappy. And I did that because I took care of my customers. And I had this customer first mentality from day one. And I really just built this community of people with my first business. And I 100% attribute me making any money with that business to doing that. And so when I sold my business in 2019, I started my current business. I thought of this book idea a couple years ago, and it just sat in a Google Drive folder for like a year and a half. And I was like, you know what, I want to teach people this concept because I work with so many people now and they don't understand the importance of like treating your customers well, and how if you treat your customers well, you take care of them you involve them with your brand, they become obsessed with you. And when you have customers that are obsessed with you, they promote you, they tell their friends, they post about you on social media, they write you reviews, and then you get business just because of them. So you don't have to do other things. Like you don't have to show up on social media every day. You don't have to do advertising if you don't want to. And I really feel like that's such a, like the future of e-commerce, so. Yeah, oh, I agree 100%. I mean, that's, that's why I wrote super fans, and I'm excited to see more books and especially an e-commerce specific one, because I feel like in e-commerce, that's a huge opportunity to build brand loyalty and and connect with people. People are often leading with their dollars and wanting to buy the product. And that could be the start of a relationship. However, most companies are treating it as like, okay, that's the end. You got your product and and we're kind of done. And I'll just promote the next one when it's ready versus the relationship. So awesome. And when, when does that book come out? It's coming out October 18th. Okay. So by the time people hear this, it should be available on all the places, right? Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited. It's like a year and a half of so much effort and tears and, and pain, every, right? <laughs> every other emotion. So. Oh, I <laughs> yeah. know. I know. That's why I want to make sure you get, get some love for it and, and credit. As we come into the final lap here, I'd love to talk about the launch plan. You know, there's a lot more that goes into this. We could get into the weeds of pricing. I mean, obviously we don't want to lose money. So if, you know, there's some obvious things, make sure that you are keeping track of how much money you spend and how much the product, you know, cost of goods sold versus how much you're making profit and you don't want to go under. Like those things are kind of, you know, table stakes, but you know, you're not going to sell products if you aren't launching. And so tell me what a launch in your eyes is like and, and how you've done it how do we get our audience excited about the product, the physical product that we now have ready to share? So I think the biggest thing is taking them behind the scenes with you, taking them on the journey with you is the easiest way. And in hindsight, I didn't do enough of that with my first launch, but how soon in the journey are we taking them with us? I would say immediately, like, like before the things even made. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. So like you have an idea for something you start the branding process, you come up with the name for it, like involve your audience, involve your people 
get feedback from them, show them all the behind the scenes stuff that you think is so boring. They think it is so interesting. And by the time you launch that thing, they are so invested in your product because they've been through the whole journey with you and they're excited about it. So that would be my biggest, 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 biggest tip. And that's the thing that I see a lot of people making mistakes on is they, the product is ready to go. And then they're like, oh, okay, I should probably tell people. And it's not that it's too late, but you've missed a big opportunity. So I always tell people record everything like record the process of you with prototypes, with getting samples, with getting the packaging in the mail, taking video of you making Canva designs of your logo or any of that stuff. People love it. People go crazy for behind the scenes. But I think the biggest thing it does is it humanizes your product. You're not a face of Amazon brand. You've, you're have you like this person who's sitting in your house at 10 o'clock on a night on a Saturday working on a Canva design. And you share that with your audience. They love it. Relatable. Yes. So get people excited as early as possible and share everything. It doesn't mean you have to share your personal life, but just share the product, like the creation, the making, all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, email marketing is your best friend. I am definitely a huge fan of email marketing. Send people emails, get people on your email list, give them an incentive to join your email list. No one wants to join a boring newsletter for a product business, they want to get your discount code. So have an incentive to get them to join early, give them some sort of special VIP, something or other. And then when you launch the product again, now you have an email list of people who are ready and aware to buy from you, you know, and then just getting, getting them excited, you know, countdown, two weeks to launch, one week to launch three days. So things like that are things that a lot of people miss opportunities to do. But email marketing, sending samples to friends, family, like micro influencers. And then on the launch day, you have all these people that are like promoting your product for you. So I would say those are a few easy and scrappy ways to launch a product. Getting people on board early is the most important thing. And to do that, all you have to do is show those like behind the scenes samples and that kind of thing. Love that. Yeah, it's called marketing, which means you are getting your market ready for the thing. It's not producting where you just wait till the product's done. That's dumb. But anyway, you had mentioned micro influencers. I think this is a, a unique opportunity that we have now versus, you know, a decade ago that we have the ability to connect with other people who have audiences who trust them. Can you share a method that if I have a product and I have an audience and, and, and maybe I don't have a lot of connections with other micro influencers in the space, like do I just send a whole bunch out and just kind of hope and pray? Or do I include a letter in there? What's your method for, for, for doing that and doing that, you know, with grace and not spamming people? Yeah. And influencers are, it's definitely, a, it's a thing that has changed a lot. I know at least when I had my business, I think it was a little bit easier to get people to promote you for free. I think now a lot of people, like everybody wants something. Oh, you have to pay me much money to post a reel. I think, you know, the easiest thing is to find people on, you know, if you're doing it organically, you know, Instagram or TikTok, but in the end, like, where's your customer hanging out? That's actually the most important place. If your customers are going to be hanging out on TikTok, then find a couple TikTok people. Sometimes follower count doesn't, not sometimes, I think follower count doesn't always matter. I actually think people with smaller accounts that have really loyal audiences, like engaged audiences, you know, look, look for comments. Don't trust the people who have 2 million followers, but you look at their posts and they literally have like one comment. Oftentimes it's the smaller accounts that will actually get you the good sales because they're not spamming. Like I think some of these big influencer accounts, they're promoting products every single day and no one wants to be sold to 24 seven. So I think those are some easy ways. There are are definitely apps and platforms that you can join that I, I personally don't know what those are, but I have heard that there are platforms that you can join. Maybe it's Bilio or Billy, Billy, Bimeo. I forget the word. So it's something with a BI and it's like an influencer account. So that could be a good thing. So they like connect your product brand to influencers. Exactly. Yeah. If you don't go through those, I, th- I think I do know of, of a few others that exist, especially for YouTubers, but that doesn't mean you can't do it if you don't have a YouTube channel. As far as reaching out to maybe some dream influencers that you have. You know, there's one or two in the space that you, you're you just like, oh my gosh, I love this person. It would be so amazing if they were to talk about my product. Is that uh, something we should consider? And do we give them the product for free? Or 
how do we go about doing that? You have to assume 100% that, especially if they have a bigger audience, that they will want to be compensated. There's a couple of workarounds around it. One is if you have an affiliate program. So I'm a huge fan of affiliate marketing in the product space. It gets you features by like YouTubers, bloggers, creators, gift guides, media features, things like that. It's You're much more able to get those features if you have an affiliate program because then the person can at least say, okay, well, if someone buys, I'll make a commission. But I think when you reach out to people, you have to expect that you're going to give free product. That's a given. Like you have to give free product. You have to offer them product. It's just a question of, will they want to charge you for that? And I think a lot of a lot of influencers do want to be compensated nowadays, but you can't, like I've never once paid an influencer with my product-based business or clients that I work with. Like we always can figure out ways to get, and I'm not trying to undercut, in, you know, influencers. I think people deserve to get paid, but if you're a small business, you might not have the budget to pay a lot of money for something. So you have to find smaller accounts, smaller bloggers. I love YouTube as an opportunity for working with an influencer. Cause I feel like, I don't know, at least with my experience, YouTubers seem more open <laughs> to doing it without charging like a million dollars. But yeah, you have to expect to give free products, but having an affiliate program is something that I find if you offer a product in an affiliate program and maybe a small fee that you'll get a lot more people that will be willing to work with you. Nice. Carrie, we could go on and on about this, I'm sure. And I think we've just scratched the surface, but enough that a person who might be interested is going to get excited about this and, and want to work a little bit further to figure this out. And I know they can figure that out with you. Where can they go to figure that out and, and get some more of your info? Yeah, thank you so much. You can go to my website, which is my first name, last name.com, Carrie Fitzgerald, and that's with an IE. And then Instagram is a good place to connect. I'm definitely very active there. So it's Carrie.a.fitzgerald. And my podcast, the Six Figure Product Business Podcast. There you go. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for this. This was incredibly helpful. And I look forward to hearing how people respond to your book and all the other businesses that you're helping and the physical products that they're creating. So well done and we'll chat soon. Thank you so much. All right. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Carrie Fitzgerald. Again, you can check out her book, Customer Obsession, as well as her podcast, the Six Figure Product Business Podcast and carriefitzgerald.com. You can find her there and on Instagram, like she said. We'll have all those links in the show notes and resources mentioned here on the show notes page at smartpassiveincome.com slash session 741. Again, smartpassiveincome.com slash session 741. And I know we're coming down to the end of the year here. Maybe a physical product might make sense for you and your business. And you can start simple, as you can see. And you can also go very complicated like Caleb and I did with the SwitchPod. It's very educational. And I do feel like, although it was difficult, although it took a ton of time, that it was definitely worth it. So you can check it out yourself. Thank you so much. Smartpassiveincome.com slash session 741. And here's to an awesome end of the year for you. I hope you are happy, healthy, and all the great things. Cheers. All the best. Thank you so much for listening to the Smart Passive Income podcast at smartpassiveincome.com. I'm your host, Pat Flynn. Sound editing by Duncan Brown. Our senior producer is David Grabowski and our executive producer is Matt Gartland. The Smart Passive Income podcast is a production of SPI Media and a proud member of the Entrepreneur Podcast Network. Catch you next week. Hey, have you ever wondered what makes the difference between a one and a five-star review? Well, turn into Behind the Review, a phenomenal podcast from the Entrepreneur Podcast Network. Each week, Yelp's small business expert, Emily Washkovic, features a different conversation with a different reviewer or business owner to find out what was really going on, as the title suggests, Behind the Review. Recently, for example, Emily featured an episode about Aldea Country Eatery, the number five spot in the world on Yelp's top 100 places to eat. Emily interviews a wide variety of customers and business owners from a wide variety of industries, tabletop gaming companies, fitness industry, you name it. This is a really fascinating peek into what makes a great customer experience for any business and you won't want to miss out. So listen to Behind the Review right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.